Hello, this is Russ and Kitty Walden with Father's Heart Ministry. The Kitty part's not with us today, but we're studying today Mark chapter 13. Jesus defines the end times. In chapter 13 of the Gospel of Mark, Jesus describes for his disciples the character and the timing of his return, of his coming. He gives a very detailed description while at the same time making clear that no man can know the day or the specific hour. So how much can we know of the coming of Christ and how much does the day we live in fit the description that Jesus gives in this chapter? We're going to share that with you today, but before we read Mark chapter 13, I want to pray for you because God said this is to be a decade of prayer. I invite you to join me in the decade of prayer. If that's in your heart, uh, then email me at russellwalden at gmail.com. That's R-U-S-S-E-L-L-W-A-L-D-E-N at gmail. This year, 2020, is the year of as in heaven, so on earth. So, Father, we bless your name. We bless your name for your protective presence in the life of our, in the lives of our partners, in the life of the, this person that's joining with me in prayer right now. Lord, we bless your name for taking them through every danger and for causing every day to dawn with an awareness and an experience, Father God of your glory. We thank you for the grace of forgiveness, Father. We falter and we err, even, Lord, even in hidden things that we're not aware of. Character flaws, sin nature asserting itself beyond our focus. We thank you, God, that forgiveness of the blood of Christ, the shed blood of Christ, is a forgiving grace upon even those things that, that, that would make them feel ashamed, those things by which the enemy tries to rob them of their joy. Lord, I just remit those sins right now in the name of Jesus to speak forgiveness to every troubled heart in the area of, of sin, morality, godliness and ungodliness right now in Jesus' name. We glorify your name, God, for well-being. You said you desired above all things that we prosper and be in health. Lord, I speak prosperity. I speak wellness. I speak wellness of body, wellness of mind right now over those that are joining the broadcast today. We glorify you, God. We thank you that we have been redeemed. We have been snatched out of the domain of darkness. And you have made our life sweet. You've caused our life sweet because you're the God that satisfies all our needs. And you're not a marginal God. God, I pray that you would meet the needs represented by those that are watching and, and listening, that you'd meet their needs that are in abundance. I prophesy to you that your needs are met not just marginally, but in abundance in Jesus' name. God, give their households your tender mercies. Order their footsteps. Every person connecting with this broadcast, order their footsteps from this point in their day through the rest of their day that they would lay down their head tonight knowing they've had an appointment with glory. Let your angels be on guard for them. Let your angels be on guard for their family, Father. For Father, we declare that the day belongs to you and we belong to you. And the glory and the honor and the adoration, Father, is yours in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's read Mark chapter 13, shall we? Mark chapter 13, and as... Jesus went out of the temple. One of his disciples said unto him, Master, I just saw an angel. Somebody really needed that prayer. I just saw this angel flash right, right here in front of me. When I see that, God is working. 
God is touching your life. If you've received a touch from God in your life, I want to hear from you. Russell Walden at gmail.com. R-U-S-S-E-L-L-W-A-L-D-E-N at gmail. Thank you, Father. As he went out of the temple, one of the disciples said unto him, Master, see what manner of stones and what buildings are here. And Jesus answering said, See thou the, these great buildings? There shall not one stone be left upon another that shall not be thrown down. If that's true, what is the western wall? We're going to talk about that today. And as he sat in the Mount of Olives over against the temple, Peter and James and John and Andrew asked him privately, Tell us, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign when all of these things shall be fulfilled? And Jesus answering them began to say, Take heed lest any man deceive you. For many will come in my name saying, I am Christ, I am anointed. That's what that word means. Uh, and shall deceive many. And when you shall hear of wars and rumors of wars, be not troubled, for such things must be, but the end shall not be yet. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be earthquakes in divers places, and there will be famines and troubles. But the end shall not be yet. There shall be famines. These are just the beginning of sorrows. Verse 9. But take heed to yourselves, for they shall deliver you up to their councils, and in the synagogues you shall be beaten. And you shall be brought before rulers and kings for my sake, for a testimony against them. And the gospel must first be published among all nations. But when they shall lead you up and deliver you up, take no thought beforehand what ye shall speak, neither do ye premeditate. But whatever shall be given to you in that hour, that speak you. For it is not you that speak, but the Holy Ghost. Now the brother shall deliver the brother to death, and the father the son, and the children shall rise up against their parents, and shall cause them to be put to death. And you shall be hated of all men for my sake, my name's sake, but he that endures to the end, the same shall be saved. But when you shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by the pro Daniel the prophet, standing where it ought not, let him that readeth understand. Then let them that be in Judea flee to the mountains, and let him that is on the housetop not go down into the house, neither enter therein or take anything out of his house. And let him that is in the field turn not back again for to take up his garment. But woe to them that are with children, to them that give suck in those days. And pray that your flight be not in winter. Isn't that interesting? Your prayers alter the trajectory and timing even of cosmic cataclysm in God's eternal timeline. For in those days shall be affliction such as not was from the beginning of creation, which God created unto this time, neither shall be. And except the Lord had shortened the days, no flesh should be saved, but for the elect's sake whom he hath chosen, he hath shortened the days. And then if any man shall say to you, Lo, here is Christ, here it is again, and lo, he is there, believe him not. For false Christs and false prophets shall arise, and shall show signs and wonders to seduce, if it were possible, even the elect. But take heed, behold, I have foretold you all things. But in those days after that tribulation, the sun shall be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light. And the stars of heaven shall fall, and the powers that are in heaven shall be shaken. And then shall they see the Son of Man coming in power in clouds with great power and glory. And then shall he send to his angels and shall gather together his elect from the four winds from the uttermost part of the earth to the uttermost part of heaven. Now learn a parable of the fig tree. When her branch is yet tender and puts forth leaves, you know that summer is nigh. So in like manner, when you shall see these things come to pass, know that it is nigh even at the doors. For verily I say to you, this generation shall not pass. How long is a generation? We're going to talk about that. All these things shall be done. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. But of that day and that hour knoweth no man. No, not the angels that are in heaven, neither the Son, but the Father. Take heed, watch, and pray. For you know not when the time is. For the Son of Man is as a man taking a far journey who left his house and gave authority to his servants and to every man his work. 
and commanded the porter to watch. Watch you, therefore, for you know not when the master of the house comes, at even or midnight, or at the cock crowing, or in the morning, lest coming, suddenly, he find you sleeping. And what I say unto you, I say to all, watch. So the previous chapter, chapter 12, concludes with Jesus remarking, on the woman with the two mites, casting in of all her living. And then Jesus turns, and he's departing the temple, and the disciples begin to gush about the magnificence of the temple of Herod. Now, who was Herod? Herod was a half-Jewish puppet king appointed by Rome who curried favor with the Jews by building the temple that bears his name. Herod was a narcissistic populist leader, both hated and admired by the people. As the disciples are carrying on with their eloquent description of the temple, Jesus dismisses this wide-eyed wonder, declaring that not one stone will be left upon another that shall not be thrown down. Now, this brings us to the question, what about the Wailing Wall? You go to Israel, they will correct you. They call it the Western Wall. That's what the Jews prefer to call it. It is reckoned by many, the, the Western Wall, to be a surviving, retaining wall of Herod's temple. If that is so, then Jesus' prophecy that not one stone will be left, not thrown down, then does that make it false? Is that true? The fact of the matter is that what we call the Western Wall or the Wailing Wall is actually a structure more connected with Herod's palace and a raised manner of egress by which he, he put up in order to access the temple without walking among the unwashed masses. Nonetheless, the disciples, they're just astonished at Jesus' remarks, and they ask him when these things will come to pass. Now, bear in mind that the Temple of Herod was an enormous complex. It was built upon a man-made enlargement of the original hill it was constructed upon. It was of preponderous dimensions, and the prospect of building it, let alone destroying it even today, would not be an easy thing. The disciples inquire, therefore, and, and Jesus' answer is not as direct as they might hope. He tells them not to be deceived because many will come. Now, why is he talking about the disposition of the temple and not being deceived? Because Herod came as a false Christ. He's alluding to Herod. Be not deceived, for many will come. In this case, he's alluding to Herod that will say, I am anointed and shall deceive many. Why? How can you be deceived by a false Christ? Because people are coming and they will use human charisma, and human charisma can act on you exactly like the anointing acts on you, if you even know what the anointing is. So it has happened today, but more to the point, see, that word Christ there, it means anointed. Jesus' warning is more than just against some larger-than-life pretender who claims I'm the Messiah. There have been enough of those that have done that. But toward those who say, follow me, follow me, I have the anointing. We are not to allow ourselves to be manipulated in this way. Just because somebody says they are anointing, anointed and you feel something spiritual coming off of them does not mean you're supposed to follow them. Jesus goes on to speak of a time of wars and rumors of wars and that we should not be troubled at these things. Conflict among nations is not an indication that the end of humanity has come. War will not end the time of man upon the earth. God will. So you don't need to worry, as many do, about an atom bomb or a thousand atom bombs destroying the planet. It isn't going to happen, and I've got scripture for it. 2 Peter 3.10 does speak about the end of the creation. It says, when the elements will melt with fervent heat, but this is going to be God's doing 
and not man's. Nations may rise against nations and even natural disasters may come. And even beyond the increase, the Minoan civilization before Rome was destroyed by a volcano. And we know very little about them. They were utterly wiped out. But these type things are only preliminary echoes of an end that only God and not man or some cataclysm in nature will bring about. See, we're not supposed to worry about the apocalypse. We're not supposed to fill our mind with that. Well, what are we supposed to be concerned with? Jesus turns the conversation and he wants us to get our mind off of some global disaster and be more concerned with challenges closer to home. What are we talking about? Of being hauled before councils, challenged for our faith. That's what happened to the disciples. He's saying, stop looking at some end time apocalypse. You need to think about what's going to be happening next week. See, even in our own nation, in the land of the free, in the home of the brave, in recent years, Christians have been forced out of business and into self-identified re-education programs because they would not bow to a liberal political agenda. Jesus' words, therefore, are very relevant for our time. Brother will betray brother, and even children will be the enemies of the cross under, under our own roof. We have lived to see the time that freedom of religion has become freedom from religion, and nowhere in evidence is that as much as our schools, where the very young are taught to question God's existence because they've been indoctrinated by a secularist, atheistic agenda reflected in the curriculum that our tax dollars are paying for, that our children are being taught. Lord help us. Jesus is making it plain to us that these things are part of the human condition. And they will be witnessed by those of us who choose the path of faith. But we're not to be distracted by it. Our trust is this. Whatever lies ahead for us, if we live to experience the events of Mark 13 as we read it, God's looking out for his elect. And it says his promise is to shorten the days. Or whatever else is necessary, to do whatever else is necessary to preserve you and to protect you and to keep you and your children and your loved ones safe in the midst of upheaval. The important thing for us to keep in mind is what is stated in verse 21. He says again, lo here or lo there. He says we are not to follow those who say lo here or lo there is Christ or the anointing. Our dependency is not to be outward upon a man or a woman of God, nor is our trust to be in the institutions of religion that are erected in his name. Our trust is an inward trust. The kingdom of God is within you. Before it is anywhere else, the kingdom of God is within you. And the case can be made that as far as Jesus is concerned, the only kingdom of his Father that should matter to us is the one that dwells on the inside of the human heart. He told the Pharisees that the kingdom of God that you're seeking, trying to understand, is on the inside of you. It's Jesus who lives in our heart by faith. Outward dependencies are idolatry, even when they come in the garb of seemingly necessary religious influence and infrastructure. Our trust is to be in him who lives on the inside of our heart. Everything else takes a back seat to that. Anyone who teaches you otherwise, teaching should enlarge who God is in your heart. And anyone who teaches otherwise is false or misguided. In all these things, Jesus is telling us to take heed of these things that are foretold. And then he goes on in verse 24 to speak of a tribulation that shall come followed by the stars of heaven falling, the sun being darkened, the moon not giving her light. Now, there are those who call themselves preterists who insist that everything uh, has happened here in Mark 13 and Matthew 24. They say it's all come to pass, and if we don't think that it's all come to pass, we are misguided and mistaken to think that any of this applies to some future day. 
To that, I would ask the question, have the stars of heaven fallen? Has the moon refused to give her light? Has the sun been darkened in some unusual way that's not common with eclipses and such? Most importantly, have we seen the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great glory and great power? We haven't seen those things. Therefore, these verses are relevant to us. Now, regarding this description of the coming of the Lord with great power and glory, I want you to ask yourself, what might that mean? And he says, coming in clouds. Now, are we talking about literal clouds? Does that mean as long as the sky is clear, we know that the Lord will not come that day? Or do the clouds represent something else? Hebrews 12.1 talks about a company of the redeemed as a great cloud of witnesses. Zechariah 10.1 speaks of the time of the latter rain when the Lord will make great clouds, speaking of an empowered people in the end time. Clouds are people. So the Lord coming in clouds may indeed speak of the Lord coming in us before he comes for us, which you can find reference to in 2 Thessalonians. Actually, 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 10. Nonetheless, the promise of God, he goes on, Jesus says that this generation that sees the budding of the fig tree, which is Israel, shall not pass until all the things that Jesus is talking about happen. So the question is, how long is a generation? Generally, we understand is when Israel became a nation, 1948. Uh, the generation that is alive when the fig tree puts forth its leaves again, when Israel became a nation once again. So that generation shall not pass. Well, how long is a generation? If you read Genesis 15, 13 through 16, it will confirm that God himself identifies a generation as being exactly 100 years. This tells us that within the lifespan of those born in 1948, these things that Mark 10, Mark 13, and Matthew 24 talk about could very well come to pass, perhaps no later than 2048. How sobering might that be? But the tantalizing follow-up is that no man can know the day and no man can know the hour that Jesus is delineating so clearly in this verse. Now, we tend to despise this whole thought of the coming of the Lord. You don't hear this taught much in churches today. Uh, the churches that uh, drop the lights down and set off the smoke machines and conduct church as performance and are more impacted by worship influencers than by the doctrine of the Word of God, the teaching of the Word of God. You bring up the coming of the Lord. They say, oh, I just think it'll all pan out in the end. That is the Bible. That is not a biblical way of approaching this. The scripture says we are to be looking for and hastening unto the coming of the Lord. And the, the angel said, this same Jesus in like manner, you will see him come again. In other words, the physical return of Jesus to the earth coming with his cloud. See, Jude talks about clouds without water, which is ungodly men, ungodly women uh, taking advantage of the love feasts of the local churches Jude was writing to. So clouds are people. So he's going to come in the clouds. 1 Thessalonians 1.10 said he will come to be glorified in his saints. He's coming in us before he comes for us. He's coming in us to cause us to be what Zechariah 10.1 says, flashing clouds full of the glory, the lightnings of God. It's a new day. It's a time we need to be aware of. We're living in that generation, I believe with all my heart, that Jesus is referring to. That generation that sees the fig tree blossom, that happened metaphorically when Israel became a nation in 1948. That generation shall not pass away. Now that either means a specific time frame, which God himself says a generation is 100 years in Genesis 15, 13 through 16, or it could mean the lifespan of someone born in 1948, which could extend it out, who knows, 20 maybe 30 more years by that time. <laughs> we're living longer all the time. But we're to be looking for and hastening unto and augmenting and participating with and aligning with the reality of a coming Christ. 
Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your sweetness in our lives. We thank you that Jesus saw to it that this narrative came down to us because he said, what I say to you, I say to all, watch. We're watching unto prayer, Father. We thank you for your presence and we thank you for your goodness. In Jesus' name, amen.